Hello, it's uh, very, very nice to be here. Great opportunity and a beautiful conference. Um, I'm going to show you some, uh, some work that we have been doing recently um, on the, with, it starts with this problem that the, the current paradigm of uh, science in general seeks for answering questions by finding uh, optimization processes. So if we think of um, cells, typically we study them in biomass, like optimal productive conditions or ecosystems in fitness, economics in uh, expected utility and so on. So this is pretty much like the way we think of, of any phenomenon in general. But this leaves apart the, the, the problem of emergence. So how these things come in the first place. So that's the, that's the point. And, and the typical uh, understanding of this, I mean, you all know about this, is that you get a complex system, there is some sort of self-organization, and, and there is some emergent system out of the parts that has this notion of somehow purpose or, of, or living system or consciousness or social system. So um, I know you know what I'm talking about, so I'm, I'm not going to spend much time, but the idea is to go to the emergence of purposeful behavior. So how this thing comes in the first place. So the emergence of an evolutionary process or... And then we got this grant with uh, Professor Francis Heiligen at the Free University of Brussels and some other people to, to study this. So our insight was that for something to have purpose, it must have to be something. And, and that being has to have certain uh, existing features. So then we go to the framework of auto, autopoiesis, uh, autopoietic systems, autopoietic structures, as the first uh, candidates to have purpose, because we expect it to, to have at least the capacity to be uh, in some form of, in some dynamic form. Um, so the, quest, uh, the topic here today is the evolution of autopoietic systems and what is the thing that evolves? Uh, what, what will be the evolutionary process here? We will explain a little bit of the, the, is the evolution of resilience. So autopoietic structures that develop uh, purposeful behavior uh, do so because they evolve in their resilience. So it still is, is very loose. Ah, and, and the guys we are working, the other two authors are Simon and, and Pedro. Um, so I will go very quickly about what resilience is. Um, this is one of those words that are used in a loose uh, but convincing ways in politics and so on. Let's be resilient and, and your organization has to be resilient. So it's a concept that is, is not very, very technical um, in most cases. If you start thinking about it, it becomes quite complex because it requires many kind of what we attribute to be cognitive abilities in order to implement it. Um, and in ecology uh, is where it has taken its most uh, formal form. Um, and actually there are many um, auxiliary uh, notions like latitude, elasticity, precariousness, and so on. But uh, the, the notion of resilience typically is uh, somehow resist a perturbation. But this perturbation that the ecologists tend to, to study uh, or, the, or, or in the context that has been formalized works in a static phase space. So um, we, the, ball has, the ball, if you, if you see, is at the top and then it can go in one side or another side. And then the perturbation will be to move the ball uh, to, to the side, or maybe to change a little bit the landscape, maybe higher or lower some parts, but I'm, I'm trying to go to, uh, let's add a new dimension to this landscape. So what happens when, with, with the notion of resilience, when you change the dimensionality of your face space? This is the case, for example, in, in ecosystems, when you have a new species coming. So not the resilience of the system itself, but the resilience under the arrival of a new species, like beavers in, in, in Chile, in my home country. They were brought by Canadians and they completely destroyed the ecosystem because they were having too many salmon escapes in the production. And then they said, oh, let's bring beavers. But they broke the trees and destroyed everything, or not everything, but yeah, you understand what I mean. Or when a new a specific technology is banned, like torrent, which has been banned, it's, it merged, it grows, it, it, it self-replicate very rapidly, but then it was banned. And now we got Netflix and we got like other types of technologies dominating the, the market, other types of products. Whereas if there would be torrent, if it would never got illegal 
I wonder if we all will be subscribed to all these things. Um, probably not. Uh, so the, the point is that there could be additions or eliminations of things. So studying the evolution of resilience requires this framework where addition and deletion of rules of the game are possible. So we call these structural changes and not mere movements or epsilon changes in the phases in the, in the static phase space. So then the, the method we will use to, to study this is, of course, reaction networks, are kind of artificial chemical universes, which are con consist basically of, of species. It's a very simple framework. Um, and reactions that can have this kind, you, you all know what I'm talking about. And, and this is a model actually of a farm. So we got chickens, we got uh, cows, we get water, we get dung, we get uh, grass. And then we got reactions like cow plus grass plus water gives cows plus milk. So the cow is a sort of catalyst that transforms water and grass into milk. So we can actually model and we get inflow and outflow. So that symbol uh, represent the empty set represents the, the external. So it's an open system in principle. And actually with this language, we can represent a large variety of systems, not only chemical systems though, for, well, everybody in this session probably knows that, but, but I want to uh, stress this point that general systems can be represented in this language and not just chemical systems. So uh, typically when we study the dynamics of a reaction network, we start with the reaction, then we build some, uh, we apply a kinetic uh, rule like mass action kinetics is typically, but there can be more interesting rules as well with a um, uh, saturation rate or some, some other forms. Um, and then we get like, for example, the differential equations, we can solve them, or we can do stochastic simulation, or we can do some kind of optimal methods uh, like flux balance analysis or something like that to, to understand what's gonna happen in a certain dynamical regime. Um, all these methods um, are, are useful and interesting, but they don't scale very well with the size of the network. So when we try to understand what's going on for a large reaction network, like a really large, like what we see in, in biochemistry, for example, um, these methods are not so, so useful. Um, there are things we cannot do. So um, we try to apply another method there, there are many competing methods. I'm not saying this is the only and best, but we are applying this one, which is the chemical organization theory to study, uh, following the words of a previous talk, like the, the viable, asymptotic viable regimes of a reaction network. So there is this idea of, uh, of a chemical organization that is, in, in, in easy words, an autopoietic structure within a reaction network. So it's like a model of autopoiesis in, in a loose way. There are lots of technicalities I'm skipping here today. And the two properties that characterize an organization is to be closed, so no new species are added, and self-maintaining, which means that the consumption and outflow rates can be matched by the production and inflow rates, so the system is able to self-produce while not generating anything new. These two pictures I show, you can see, uh, I'm going to go back again, so you can see the same farm example I was showing you before, and organizations are just like sub-networks. So the, the color nodes are those that are active and the gray nodes are those that are inactive. So we don't have those species in the system, but, but the subsystem is still an organization. So the interesting thing is that the set of organizations forms, forms, of course, a hierarchy, a partial order set. So some organizations are contained in others, some share species, but are not contained and so on. So it's a it's a hierarchy, a partial order set, and even can be a lattice. And there is a whole like algebraic a development of of the of the logic of organizations, um, but they form uh, a landscape of what is stable enough to be observed in the long run. So, what are the subspaces of the phase space where you can possibly find an asymptotic viable uh, state or, or trajectory, let's say, attractive. And, and interestingly, also, no matter what dynamical rules we apply in for a very wide um, class of, of dynamics, the long term dynamics will be understood, can be understood as movements between organizations triggered by external perturbations, like, as I was saying, the, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the one. So this is the hierarchy of organizations. My, my slides are kind of crazy. And this can be like the movement 
between organizations. So that's the partial order set of all the organizations for a typical reaction network. And then I will go for an illustrative example just to, to catch the concepts. Take this reaction network, and let's say we start with the set X. We only have X in our system. No reactions can be triggered, so we end up with X in a trivial organization. If we start with Y, then if you look at the reactions, you can easily find that we will end up with set W. So the set you start with does not necessarily is not necessarily contained in where you will end up with. Um, if we start with X Y, we end up with X Y W set, which is closed and self-maintained um, in the in the dynamical sense. And now, if we eliminate W from X Y set W, we nothing happened because W can be regenerated by the fourth reaction. But if we eliminate Y, the, the whole system will collapse. So these organization movements are the, the kind of uh, object that we are interested to study to, as I said, kind of like provide a model for how uh, goal directedness could have emerged. Um, okay, so there are lots of cases. And now I will show the, the algorithm that we developed to study these dynamics. So we start from uh, any organization. And then we have a perturbation that is adding, for example, a set of species that will create an extended uh, set of species that can probably trigger new reactions. So we will recursively add the species that correspond according to the new reactions that are activated until we reach the closed set. If that closed set is an organization, we end the iteration and we wait for the next uh, perturbation. But if, let's say another example, I add the thing, but I get to a closed set that is not self-maintaining, then I will go to the, with equal probability to the next possible uh, organizations that are below in my hierarchy, below to that closed set, because something has to be depleted and I don't care uh, most, um, uh, very much about the dynamics. I just give equal probability to all of them to see uh, what happens because there are dynamical conditions that will match that anyways. So I kind of skip the whole dynamical analysis of it to just look about uh, for for what organizations tend to appear more often because I look for I'm looking for the resilience we are. And if we eliminate the species, the same procedure applies. In this case, I'm just making the complex one where you reach a closed set. It's not an organization, so there are three organizations underneath in the closest case. So one third probability to each of them. And then. The Markovian framework is basically a random walk over the organization hierarchy. So organizations will be nodes of this Markov graph, and then the random walk uh, is, is based on transitions that are triggered by the arrival of new species that in a chemical or biochemical setting or ecological setting can be migration. So things come from external meteor, uh, from, from whatever, a rocket or something, or mutations. So new things come, come out appear, or deletion of current species, like changes in sudden changes in, temp in temperature, or uh, wind that moves some particles that, that they won't be there anymore. So the, the environment takes care of deleting things, um, or, or politics, or the case of Torrent. So then we get like, we run simulations, we run this, this algorithm a few times, and then we compute the, uh, the Markov graph with the probabilities that we found according to the frequency in which each, each transition happens in our algorithm. So then we get this model, and then we can make a little bit of mathematics to define resilience, because of course we will get this transition matrix, and then we can also establish an initial distribution. So we will say, where do we want our organizations to be at the beginning of the simulation? We put all the mass of the probability in one organization. It's very simple. And then we got this local resilience that is the ability to resist perturbations and it's actually the diagonal value of the transition matrix. And then the global resilience, which is how often you visit the organization in the overall dynamics, which is uh, like the transition matrix uh, power uh, to the infinite, having that you started from that given organization. So how often you will visit the organization if you start from there in the long run. So, um, this is uh, uh, just simple measures. We can build many, many more measures and we're working on that. But interestingly, local and global are not necessarily correlated. And there are easy, easy ways to imagine this. So these are two interesting forms of 
resilience, because we are thinking of goal directedness, then and resilience is like our proxy to that. And you can be very goal directed to towards remaining where you are, or uh, goal directed towards like passing by that state, like keeping it with you. So this is also related to identity and all these things in in a, in ways that we can discuss outside this talk. One minute, okay. So I will go very quickly to the evolutionary hypothesis and the little tests we have done, which is like, if you look at the complexity, we have proxies for complexity, also many measures. Um, and, and if you look for to the dynamics of perturbations, you will find that the system kind of grows in complexity and remains for more iterations in those states. And uh, so, the, we have found uh, with examples with the bio models and um, randomly generated networks, and we have compared these things. We find that random networks kind of correlate complexity with uh, resilience very much, but real or bio model networks don't do so that much. And we are working on this characterization, but I want to finish with this new idea, which is the collective resilience. Um, so when we, we when we have been doing this analysis, we found that certain organizations are not very locally, neither globally resilient, but most of their transitions, the most likely transitions go to other organizations whose difference is not that big. So they are pretty much the same structure, not the same one. So there is some sort of identity conservation. And then they also form loop-like structures. So many steps you come back, so they are kind of all interconnected and they all look like. This is one example where you can see like the top organizations, they are all like kind of interconnected very strongly with the, with links. The, the width of the link is the, the probability. So the, we, we tested the, the, the hypothesis whether a collection of organizations can be more resilient than its parts. And the basic answer is that yes. And also that uh, collective resilient, and we, we tested two things. One thing is take a collection and test whether the, 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 the whole is more resilient than the maximum of the resilience of the parts, and also if it's larger as well than its complement, so the other set of organizations, the complement set of organizations. And we found that both things can happen, and actually the larger the, the system, uh, the more chances has to be more largely resilient than its maximum, and also uh, it can even be largerly resilient than the maximum and the complement simultaneously, like in these two arrows I show. So I will leave you with conclusions, like uh, all what I said, like we can study the evolution of goal directedness with, uh, with this framework. Um, and it's uh, very interesting to, to think further on the collective uh, aspect of, of resilience, because it's like a process, not like an object. Um, and I will have to say goodbye with this uh, invitation to publish in a journal that I am an editor of. So if you want, if you have something to to publish in uh, this kind of things, uh, let me know and we can maybe uh, get some uh, way to make it easier for you. So thanks a lot.